Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan. And I'm Alex. And uh, Alex, uh, you you do a little bit of game design here and there. Uh, I bet you wish that you had some uh, maybe tools to help you out with that. Absolutely. Well, I've got good news for you. Uh, today on the show, very special show, folks, we have uh, two people whose resumes are very, very, very long. And we will not be able to tell you their entire resume because it will take the entire show. But... Uh, with us today, we have uh, Jeremy Holcomb. Jeremy, thank you for being on. Happy to be here. Excellent. And uh, Jeff Tidball, also, thank you, Jeff, for being on the show. Yeah, thanks for inviting us. Oh, you're you're very welcome. Uh, what is uh, particularly funny, I won't bore you too much, but uh, Alex, there was a, an interesting story that we had uh, going into this, if you want to relay that real quick. <laughs> so um, I had found the white box which you guys both made. And I friend had shared the post on Facebook and I went, Oh, that sounds really cool. And I went and I looked at it and I backed it. And then on a whim, I went, let's see if the creators of this would come on the show and talk to us. And so I sent uh, Jeff a message, uh, which obviously got. And so after that, Nathan, I, I was telling Nathan about it. I go, Hey, we're going to have these guys who made this awesome Thing called the white box on and uh what what did you do Nathan? uh well i i immediately started looking at some of the things that the two of you had done and um i i don't think alex had quite looked that deep into your uh profiles and then we realized that everything that uh he ever wanted to talk about is pretty much represented between the two of you so <laughs> so, so that that made him very very excited uh, because we we literally had just stopped finishing. We we literally was just talking about, oh, yeah, Doctor Who's really cool. It wouldn't be great to have somebody from Games Workshop and Fantasy Flight and all. And then we started looking and go, oh, OK, so there's that. So <laughs> so we were we were uh, just tickled pink about that. Uh, <laughs> so we're, we're really happy to have you guys on. So speaking of that, uh, let's let's get a little bit into that. Um, so, Jeremy, I'm going to start with you. Uh, since we can't tell people everything that you've done, what should the folks out there know about you? Uh, sure. I've made a lot of games and a lot of them are terrible. That's okay. Um, and some of them are good. And I've learned a lot over the 20 years that I've been making board and card and dice games, uh, so much so that I'm now teaching game design as uh, faculty at DigiPen helping people to, to craft games and, and develop into mostly video game designers here. Um, mm -hmm. And I've learned a lot of things about how to make games, how to think about making games, uh, about how to publish them or pitch them to publishers. And I really wanted to solve a lot of the questions that come up over and over again with tools like the white box so that people who are starting where I started don't have to make all the mistakes themselves like I did. <laughs> That I can see how that would be really useful. And that's at uh, DigiPen Institute of Technology? Yes, that's correct. Excellent. Professor of Game Design, that has got to be a, a fascinating uh, subject overall. It, it really is a dream job, right? I get to spend yeah. all of my time talking to people who are really passionate about games and helping them make games better, faster, more efficiently, more effectively, more fun. Excellent. And Jeff, okay, can can you just give us a brief rundown, if it's possible? of the projects that you've worked on? Sure. Um, I was really, really fortunate to be able to kind of through local game club networks here in the Twin Cities in Minnesota, get even before I graduated from college, a job at Atlas Games working on various non-design projects. But once you're in the door, it is much easier to branch out into design and development. So I was the Ars Magica role-playing game line developer for for about three years in the late 90s. Um, did my first board and card games, respectively, for Atlas in that time period. Uh, and then I left the game design business forever for the first time. Wound up working for Decipher as the line developer for the Lord of the Rings role-playing game. 
uh, came back to Atlas and did a game called Pieces of Eight, which is a coin-based uh, game that you play with, with these minted metal coins that you hold in your hand that was uh, designed with the idea that you should have a great game you can play while standing in line at Disneyland that doesn't <laughs> Able and that you can just keep in your pocket. <laughs> okay. When, when we moved back to Los Angeles, my wife and I, I went to work at Fantasy Flight Games, and I was there for about three years. Uh, during part of that time when Fantasy Flight first got the license from Games Workshop to do board and card games based in their world. So that was the time period where I worked on Horus Heresy, for example, the Fantasy Flight Games edition of that. Uh -huh. uh, left the game industry forever for the second time to <laughs> an interactive agency in Kansas City, but then returned to Atlas again to um, kind of do, mostly at Atlas I do management and production. I'm the chief operating officer because one of the things that I've discovered over a career in the game industry is that there are many, many people who are good at designing games and it's something of a rarer skill to be able to organize them and manage the production processes. So that's something that I wind up doing a lot, even though I love to design games also. And it, it seems like that's something that Jeremy's found also with the ability to teach about game design. I don't have put words in his mouth, but in addition to being able to design them, he's able to talk about them, why they work, how you would design them, um, what you should do, not just here is a thing that I've done. Excellent, excellent. Jeremy, I, I know he just put words in your mouth, but would you agree with that? Well, I, I'm thrilled to have him putting words in my mouth because <laughs> he's absolutely correct that the ability to actually understand how to get this stuff out into the world, the, the processing and the diligent detail and other things that designers are often very bad at and, and um, can develop those skills or... Um, they can they can bob them off to very skilled professionals and go out and make more stuff. So a, a little bit more about the white box, uh, in case people are not familiar with it. it. It's a very unique project. It is a game design workshop in a box. So why? Anyone can answer this except Alex. Uh, Alex is not allowed to answer oh. this. Sorry. <laughs> I know you were really excited to talk about it, but um, why was it important to make this? Uh, Jeff, you can start. <laughs> sure. Well, uh, Game Playwright is kind of a side business that Will Hindmarch and I started um, while I was at Fantasy Flight because we're very interested in uh, the place where game design and storytelling overlap. And we later sort of expanded the brief of that to include the overlap of the work of creating games and stories. So Game Playwright is a non-fiction publishing imprint. Prior to the white box, we have three different books that we've published that all deal with the overlap of those things. And um, as, as part of my general publishing work, Jeremy and I met up at an event at the Gamma Trade Show, and one of the things that he had that he was putting together was this white box project that I kind of immediately identified as something that Game Playwright would do and would be interested in and would be very pleased to be able to help put in the hands of more people who, who want to make games. People like me. Yeah, and that was yes. really the, the, the thing that caused me to want it to come out into the world in the first place. Again, like, I'm, I've, I've made a lot of games and so I did a lot of stuff uh, poorly, but also um, I find found myself going to a lot of conventions and helping out new designers, sitting on panels and, and uh, being invited to give sort of like how to how to make a game talks or some advice and tips and tricks talks. And when you do that, you find new designers, right? Everybody's making different stuff, but some stuff just comes up over and over again. Um, and the third, fourth, fifth, seventh, hundredth time you find yourself answering the same question, I at least went, oh, wait, like there needs to be a tool for people because mm. clearly lots of people are having these questions and going through this this process. And um, there are there are plenty of good answers, but it's it's something that you can co codify and kind of go, hey, from a big picture without knowing about your individual project, here is a lot of wisdom um, that can help you make your stuff faster and more efficiently and help you really make the game that you're you're trying to make. 
somebody should write a book. Uh, <laughs> here, here's, here's how foolish I am. This was the original plan. My idea was okay. I'm going to provide a box of useful bits, sort of a game design toolkit with all the meeples and tokens and things, because I've built several of those for myself and I find them very useful. Um, and I thought I will include a small pamphlet of just a couple of thoughts that seem like good ideas, stuff that I'm like, wish I had known this. Right. Um, and I used that phrase, small pamphlet, for a long time while we kept adding more content um, until we're up to, I don't know, uh, how big is this thing now, Jeff? Uh, it is 208 pages as it goes to <laughs> press a, this week. Right, it's, it's a 208 page pamphlet. Pamphlet. <laughs> that, that, is, uh, that is handy. You can keep it in your pocket. That's, yeah. that's something yeah. you go door to door with. <laughs> Right. Have you heard the good news? <laughs> <laughs> Just smash it over your head. You'll you'll get it eventually. Um, so yeah. Well, you know, it's a big pamphlet, but at least it's a useful one. Yeah, uh, uh, it's gotten some fairly extensive testing. People have really gotten to to use it and build better games because of it. I'm excited to see it have done so well. So, uh, what are the typical problems that designers experience when they're starting out? T you say typical. Um, he just mentioned a 208-page pamphlet <laughs> to answer typical questions. Well, Granted. Well, here's, here's what I think is a very typical problem, and I think that the white box is extremely unique in its ability to solve that problem. Um, but to talk about it, I want to take a step back even to talk about the uh, kind of industry that exists around creating things. So you can go uh, anywhere and see workshops and apologies for this it's phone. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. You can go to lots of different places and see workshops that are intended for people who would like to write novels or write screenplays or become directors or do all of these creative things that sound very exciting to do uh, and are in fact very exciting to do. But what you often wind up with is a culture of people who are interested or whose hobby becomes learning about doing the thing that they want to do. Mm -hmm. And the reason I think that Jeremy's white box idea is so excellent is it is not just a book, but it is a box of things that you actually use to begin designing a game. And so in addition to being information, it is also an explicit invitation to just begin to do it and not only to learn about it. Ah, oh, okay. That's yeah, I interesting. I mean, the way we open the white box really is talking about why you're even having this conversation, what you actually want to do. Um, and there's a meaningful difference for people between I have some ideas, like I have I have this game, I have this idea, and I really want to put it out exactly this way. It's 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 my baby, and I want it to look like this, and that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. Here's how you might go about bringing that into the world, versus wow, I'm really interested in making games. Um, I would like to make a bunch of them and send them off to publishers. Um, how do I do that? Um, those are very different beasts. But yeah, my hope is that nobody picks up the white box, reads it to cover, to cover to cover, goes, wow, that was really smart. I feel smarter now. Puts it on a shelf and then goes away. Right? Right. They, they take all these, these bits and tokens and dice and the salt shaker off the table and whatever they have lying around and start mm -hmm. making things. Um, yeah. If for only if for no better reason, because I want to play them. Right. Actually, you have to actually do it after you start. Instead yep. of just think about it, right? That um, that actually brings me to Alex. You had a very interesting question that you wanted to address to Jeremy. Do you want to do that now? Wh which one? I, I'm <laughs> sure I had a couple. I sent it to you on Skype because you knew that you wouldn't remember. Oh, you're right. Okay. Yeah, I th I thought this through. Where, where... I'm glad somebody did. Uh, it was about uh, uh, a game design kit. Uh, when he's a professor of game design. Oh, okay. Right. Thank you. My memory is terrible. That's I'm why I blaming, wrote it down. I'm blaming overnights. Anyways, um, so I wanted to know, as a, a professor of game design, do you feel that the white box and things like that are a suitable substitute for people taking actual game design courses? 
Well, I think that it's something that helps people figure out if that's really what you want to do for a living, right? It's a really good introductory tool to go, here's the starting part of the process to begin actually making stuff. And if you discover that that's something that you're really passionate about, um, it's not dissimilar to the excellent series of tutorial videos called Extra Credits, talking about games. And it's the sort of thing, oh, I've been exposed to this, and I've learned that, oh, I don't I don't actually really want to do this. But if you are passionate, if you're just like, wow, I really wish all of those were longer and more in depth, then you, you know that this is the sort of thing that you're really wanting to do. Most of the people that I know in the game industry, board games or video games, are people who d didn't really get to make a decision. They didn't choose to make games. They didn't at any point go, well, I could be an accountant or I could be a game designer. <laughs> um, they're, they're people who are going to make games. Only it's the way their brain sees the world. Um, and this is just kind of a tool to, refrain, to, to refine those frameworks um, and then help them on that. Path. So it's not going to replace your job. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, nobody learns to be a game designer by listening to the melodious sound of my voice. Um, you're not going to be a game designer by reading this book and then putting it back on a shelf. It's about mm -hmm. doing things, and that's why this is this is a toolkit to help you do those things, and why so much of, of course, what you would be uh, taking a class for, hopefully, from me or from anybody else, is the the hands-on feedback with your own personal work and process to to get better at this stuff. I see. So 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 white box first. Then classes. Right, exactly. <laughs> so well, there's, so there's I mean, they are, they are substitutes for each other only in the same way that uh, seats on the third base line are a substitute for box seats. They're two different ways to watch a <laughs> baseball game that are different, and that's fine. Right. You might get a more visceral experience out of one than the other, but you're still observing, if nothing else. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I, I I like the idea that there's actually like a suite of of uh, pieces because Alex is a fledgling game designer himself, and I'm sure that's why he wanted to back the project. Uh, and I know that he he has uh, some of these problems too about actually just getting time and and the ability to actually put things down. What I was wondering though was when uh, you were developing the white box, did you having done game development? up to this point, have any epiphanies about your own approach to game design? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, there are so many elements of the ways to refine like a playtesting process and how you ask questions. There was a lot of stuff on how to, how I sort of retain data, how I, I, I like have an idea and what am I doing to write that down and, and um, uh, codify it so that I can go away and work on other stuff and then come back six months later and be like, what was I doing? What was the plan? I have, mm. I've slept since then. Um, I have to make these notes for myself. Uh, and just the act of describing how I do things to other people helps me really look at it and, and, and make it better. Um, and some of the book is talking about my process, but a lot of it is, is just talking about different ways to approach design problems. Um, and some of that talks about how I do it, but some of that also goes, well, or you could do it like this, or you could do it like this. I don't, I do not have the way. Uh, <laughs> I have lots of ideas for what your way might look like, and I can help you figure that out. Excellent. Uh, Jeff, any epiphanies during the process? Well, we had, Jeremy is the one who wrote all of the content of the White Box essays, which is the book. Um, but we we had interesting discussions about a couple of the chapters. There was one in particular where I think I was skeptical, the game balance chapter, I was skeptical of some of Jeremy's assertions in there. Um, and we went around, and so one of the things that I do as a check on whether I'm just wrong about that is I would just jump on Facebook and say, does anybody think X? And a long discussion about X ensues uh, and then because Jeremy and I are connected on Facebook, he winds up wandering into that discussion and realizing that I'm talking about one of those essays. But um, <laughs> but that was extremely productive in multiple cases, I think. And we wound up in that particular case with an essay that I think um, reflects changes to both of our opinions on what game balance is and what it's good for and what you should strive for in a game. But again, there, I'm maybe putting words in Jeremy's mouth. Maybe the edits there came so I would shut up. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
no, I, I, I agree with the, the fundamental point, which is that I have a very um, angled approach on certain things, and game balance is certainly one of those things that I feel very strongly about, uh, because I, I feel like I've watched it derail a lot of projects, and so the way to communicate what I was feeling and the way to do that in a way that is most useful to people at all levels of design, but certainly for people who are, are just starting out, um, I think that the, the end result, certainly, I, I cannot thank um, Jeff and the whole team there and the, the editors and all of the people who've turned my, um, in some cases, kind of freeform thought process into something you would actually want to read. So the result is a much better document. I have a question forming in my head around all of this. Um, you, you've both taught game design, and you were mentioning how there is no the way. Like, there is no, the way is not there, and everyone has a different process to get to that point. When you're trying to teach new designers um, how to get to that point, and everyone has a different approach to it, is that hard at all? Well, I mean, it's difficult in the sense that you want to provide some guidelines and go, hey, you can do whatever you want inside this focused space, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I don't generally like standing up and going, this is correct, this is wrong, because the game design is um, a malleable space. But there are certain things where I'm just like, look, you have to do playtesting. You have to do iteration. You have to listen to other people's feedback. You don't have to do it, but you have to listen to it um, <laughs> and use that to gradually iterate your, your game into a better space. And you have to give yourself permission to have ideas and put them down and have them suck. Because the, fir <laughs> the first thing that you put on the table is going to be terrible. The first thing that I put on the table, if I'm making a new game, the first thing I put on the table is terrible. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the difference is that I, I sort of give myself permission for that and try to figure out, okay, inside this terrible thing, is there something good? Is there something salvageable? What can I uh, cut away or add or remove or whatever? Um, and some people are really resistant to that. It can be very hard for new designers. I mean, you build a thing and you just go, this sucks. I guess I can't be a game designer. Uh, <laughs> that happens all the time. Or they go, I have built this thing and people are telling me it sucks. I'm not going to listen to those people. Um, and that is not a path that gets you to producing games. Right. I have to listen to people. It's not going to be perfect out of the gate. Nah. Table flip. Table flip. <laughs> and it's over, everybody. Well, we had a good run. Well, um, I mean, it's just It's fighting imposter syndrome, right? It's yeah. exactly the same thing that I think all creative people oh, have. I have yes. it, right? Um where, where you just go, oh, like, am, am I really good enough to do this? And you yeah. find ways to push past that. Yeah, you think, I must be faking it, and somebody's called me out on it now, and, and I can't do it anymore. Right. The thing that I find is most difficult to teach, or that is essentially impossible to address in a workshop situation, is to, is to help someone figure out what it is that they want to do. Because I'm able to give all kinds of tactical advice about how you should choose a printer or why you need an editor or what are useful questions to ask play testers. Um, but I can't tell someone whether they should produce a card game about garden gnomes or whatever it is that they want to make, right? You have to, or or even more importantly, I, I can't help someone figure out why they want to design games. And that's one of the really keystone things that the very first essay in the White Box essay talks about is uh, why are you coming to game design? Do you want to make that a career or do you have a single idea for a game that you feel must be out there and and so that's all about knowing yourself and and what you want out of life and that's something that that probably the white box can't really help you solve <laughs> for better or for worse but i to a certain extent neither can all of philosophy so true <laughs> yeah true. it's absolutely the sort of thing there where i just want people to answer those questions for themselves so they can figure out how to use the white box what to, what to try to get out of it. Um, I definitely, it is a, a collection of essays, and in that space, it's not a, like, cover-to-cover -cover book. You, you certainly can read it like that, but it's more of a choose-your-own-adventure novel, really, where you go, oh, I'm really interested in self-publishing. I'm really, I have this one idea, and I'm really in love with exactly 
how it's going to look and I want to craft that and, and, and put my idea out in the world. Therefore, I should read these essays and I can kind of skip over some of these other essays. Or, oh, like I, I want to make games. I'm maybe interested in doing this as a career. How mi might I do that? Then you, you choose your own adventure different. I see. To crowdfund your game, turn to page 79. Yeah. Hire a graphic designer, turn to page 114. <laughs> and, and almost exactly correct. And and uh, half of them just end with, you are dead, the end. Right, you have been killed by a grow. <laughs> I, I love that my mind also immediately went to the groove joke. You got it up a little bit faster than that. Yep. Yep. <laughs> That's terrific. Um, I also know that uh, if I if I get my hands on the white box, the first thing I got to do is that uh, garden gnome card game. That's yeah, the first thing. <laughs> that actually uh, that sounds very much like something you would create, Nathan. It, it certainly is right up there with Lice Capades. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> Al Alex, uh, since you are, uh, you know, adjacent to game design, uh, and we have uh, these two very esteemed gentlemen on the show. As a designer, uh, what questions have you always wanted to ask uh, about the process? Oh, man. My biggest thing, uh, for me personally, I, I want to get your thoughts. What do you think is the hardest part for someone coming into game design to start with? Like, you know, for me, I sit there and I can go, I can go, I, I design cool mechanics and I can think of cool concepts and I can kind of write it down. And then I kind of falter when I'm like, where does this all come together? So I was wondering, like, what you guys think of that. That makes sense. And I think that uh, every designer is going to have a slightly different stumbling block. But that space of, OK, I have this thing. I, I have this idea for a mechanic. I've put it together. Now what? Um the thing that I would suggest, and that of course we spend a bunch of time in the white box on talking about, is playtesting. Is actually going out there and finding people who aren't you, and ideally finding people, uh, forgive me, who don't really care about you, right? Like <laughs> it, it's great to playtest with your friends, it's great to playtest with your family, but those people have to be putting up with you. And it's super nice to go out to your friendly local game store or to to a coffee shop and find random passerbys and be, hey, like, I'm working on this game. Do you have a, have a minute to play it? Because they don't care about you, and they're never going to see you again. <laughs> Their willingness to tell you what they really think is valuable and learning how to go get that and learning how to really, um, you know, not not feel like that stings too much is is difficult. And that would be my, my suggestion for the next step. There you go. Uh, so basically, uh, let them burst your bubble. <laughs> yep, because it's going to be very useful for you down the line. You get well, even, that way. Even prior to that step of taking it out to people that you don't know, and this is very much related, I think, to Jeremy's answer, the thing that is more difficult than getting the first bits of your idea onto a table are finding people who can help you test the design and even sanity check your assumptions about the design. Uh, one of the smartest things that I did when I left Fantasy Flight and became a full-time freelancer for a while was recruit people to join a regular playtest group that met every week and played whatever it is that I was working on at the time because you can use a lot of mental effort trying to assemble a group of people for each project uh, and that's that's mental effort that you can't be using on your game. So having a circle of people uh, who you trust to show them things that are not yet fully baked and who will give you feedback that helps you out uh, is crucial, in my opinion. No, I can definitely I can agree with that, too. I feel like a lot of we, we talk to a lot of smaller game designers, people who are either self-publishing Kickstarter or things like that, who are either solo or very small teams of people. So I feel like that is is very pertinent uh, to them as well. And when you're in that position, uh, having allies can really keep your morale up. Um, if you are starting a small game publishing company, having a partner is huge because then you've got somebody who can help pick you back up when the worst thing ever happens or whatever. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. Allies and partners are huge, especially if you are small, especially if you are just starting out. And Excellent. it's so valuable because it's it's so good to work with people just because explaining the ideas to them help make them more clear. And having somebody where just like, oh, well, on Thursday, I'm going to see everybody. Uh, I got to have something to put on the table. Um, that can really force you to actually make this stuff happen, to actually keep putting this stuff out and iterating it. All of the projects that I've worked on that I am the most proud of have all been um, myself and another designer uh, telling each other we're wrong over and over again until we get a great game. Yeah, so my playtest group meets on Wednesday nights, and our sales manager here at the Atlas office, Travis, knows that it is Wednesday because on Wednesday afternoon, I have the paper cutter out on the conference table preparing a prototype, like the, almost always. It's never ready before Wednesday afternoon. Uh, <laughs> but, the, but that idea that the, the group's meeting forces the design to iterate is absolutely uh, and shamefully accurate. Yep. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, uh, Jeremy, you had mentioned that you might have to get going fairly soon. Correct. Okay. Uh, I have one specific question for you, and I'll make sure, sure. to get that in now. Um, so you're a professor of game design. We've already established that. Um, if we were to wax philosophical for a moment, which I'm, I'm so happy to do, um, what qualities do designers need to possess? You have to have, obviously, that's a long, long, long list. Mm -hmm. The most <laughs> yeah. important thing is a willingness to keep putting your ideas out there and to listen to as many people as possible about them and to learn how to use that feedback to make the games actually happen, right? Um, and to get past not wanting to hear bad things and to get past uh, basically doing stuff because other people said so. Um, and that that craft of learning how to you how to basically learning how to iterate games is so incredibly core to what's happening um, that I think of that as the the sort of first step. So like perseverance. Yeah. In some yeah. Ways. I mean, a lot of stuff is going to suck, um, and a lot of times you <laughs> this game is terrible, and a lot of times that will be because it's actually terrible. Um, <laughs> and giving yourself permission and sometimes putting your own stuff on a shelf and coming back to it later or figuring out how to keep yourself motivated and keep yourself making stuff. It's the, again, it, uh, I go back to the, the sort of creative beast where maybe I'm not working on that particular game. I have stuff on the shelf where I'm like, I haven't looked at this game in two years, but I'm still working on lots of different stuff. And I want, I, I want to get this stuff to the point that it can come out. Uh, my, my other question that I had really involved in that was, uh, we've talked a lot about like fledgling game designers, but if you are an experienced game developer, is there something that you can get out of the white box if you pick it up? Yeah, I certainly hope so. There's a lot of stuff where we're talking about elements of design, for example, uh, inclusivity and thinking about who your audience is that I, I quite frankly wish more of our industry would be paying attention to. Um, and a lot of the conversations about uh, what kinds of, of audiences are using our games and what we can do to help reach them um, is something that I hope everybody takes takes advantage of. Uh, the, the other question I actually had was specifically for Jeff. Um, and uh, Jeff, you've taught game design workshops at Origins and Gen Con. Um, is there a moment when you can tell that a designer essentially like sees the matrix and truly understands the process of game design? No, I don't. I don't <laughs> have the sense that that is a switch that flips so much as it is a, a a long journey of learning many many small things. I think that there are times when people who are just putting their toe in suddenly have a sense of what a large undertaking it is to publish a game when they are like suddenly, oh my God, there are customs brokers and print quotes and proofs to review and another year of play testing and a graphic designer to hire. So I definitely think there are moments when the enormity of the task becomes clear to people. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but I don't think there's a creative moment when suddenly minds are open. Certainly, I suppose that that could happen, but I, I have not seen that personally. I don't know. Have you, Jeremy? 
No, I think it, I think I agree with you in the space of um, if there is a switch that gets flipped, the switch is whether or not you really want to put the game out in the world and expose it to lots of people and let it grow and evolve and um, get modified by other people and become a thing, or whether or not you want to hold it close to your chest and protect it from people um, and, and keep it as your own. And that is um, a perfectly fine space that lots of people get into, and, and the people who, who hold the idea to their chest and protect it as their own don't make games. Um, they have a thing in their garage and they will have that thing in their garage forever and if that's what they want that's okay but that's 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 a moment where you you sort of um, become willing to open this up or not so I have definitely had moments where some particular comment has wildly expanded my idea of what has to be done or scared the hell out of me in terms mm. of how much uh, information other folks are taking into account. So, for example, while I was working at, at Fantasy Flight Games, uh, Eric Lang was working on lots of projects there, and so he would be in the office for a month at a time. Uh, so he, he lives elsewhere, but would come to develop a game or something. And so we'd be working on a project, but he was talking about some CCG expansion for a game that was not even a Fantasy Flight product. I don't remember what it was. I think maybe it was a, a Wizards expansion for some CCG that they had at the time. And he remarked on a particular card and said something like, well, you would not want to use this card, but it advertises the mechanic to the players. And the concept that there would be a card in that set whose purpose is to market a mechanic to people who have already bought the game made my head explode all <laughs> over the inside of the conference room or wherever it was that we were at and realize that Eric was playing this game that was two levels deeper than one that I <laughs> was aware existed. Um, and so I think probably everyone has those moments of evolution as a designer. And certainly Eric Lang is playing the game of game design on a much deeper level than most of the rest of us are. So those, those moments of epiphany and understanding certainly exist for everyone, but I think that they're probably not the same from designer to designer to designer. Oh, wow. Yeah, that sounds fascinating. It reminds me of like Gameception. It's like Inception, but for uh, games. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's absolutely how it works. And, and I must leave you now, but thank you so much for having me on. Oh, thank you so much, Jeremy. We thank really you. enjoyed having you on. Uh, and the white box looks great. Um, Jeff, would you be able to stick around for a few minutes? Or? Yeah, you bet. I've got another 10 or 15 at I, least. I will leave you in 10 capable hands. Okay. Oh, thanks, Jeremy. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Jeremy. Jeremy. So, turning our attention back to you, Jeff. Um, one technical thing is, uh, when did you actually get involved with the White Box project? Like, w what was what was uh, the point where you actually uh, kind of uh, came into the fold on this? Well, it was when Jeremy and I met up at that Gamma Trade Show event. <laughs> Uh, and I honestly do not remember which year that was. I think probably at, as we talk now, it was three or maybe even four years ago. And, and Jeremy was at an event where he had a number of different designs that he was showing off. And so the white box was on a table with other things that he was looking for publishers for. Uh, and he and I had met before, but that, that event at the Gamma Trade Show was where I first became aware of his white box project and thought, that would be perfect for game playwright. And he and I got into touch about it specifically uh, later in that show, I think, and, and sent that around a couple times via email. So that was the start of my involvement. I see. Can, can I talk about game playwright for just a minute? Of course. Um, I was wondering. So you, you set up game playwright originally? Uh, Will Hindmarch and I, yes. Will Hindmarch, okay. How long ago was that? Uh, that would have been... 2008 or so, give or take. 2008 years ago? Oh, no. Two, okay. Year 2008. Okay. <laughs> I know sometimes about it feels like About 10 years that. ago, Nathan. About 10 years ago? Okay. I know sometimes it feels like 2000 years when you're, when right. you're doing stuff. Um, why, why did you guys want to actually build Gameplay Right to begin with? 
Well, Will and I started out with the idea that Game Playwright would be a, a website and blog where we talked a little bit more rigorously than either of us would have individually on our own blogs or whatever about games and about stories, because he and I had both spent a lot of time working as RPG developers. I had worked on Ars Magica and on Feng Shui and on the Lord of the Rings RPG. Will had worked on uh, Feng Shui and then had spent a lot of time in Atlanta working for White Wolf on Vampire, I think the second edition of oh, yeah. that. I, I forget which order their editions come in and they all have different titles. But we had wanted to work together and so didn't necessarily want to publish more games, but that was something we were both interested in, something that was not being talked about at the time as widely as we wanted it to be. So that that was why we originally formed Game Playwright as a, as a website. And then our first book, which was called Things We Think About Games, grew naturally out of the things we wanted to say on that site. I see. And the rest is history. The rest is history. So, so it's kind of like why we made the show to talk about the things dealing with game design and game developers, um, except on a sort of, like that. sort of different level. Sure. <laughs> yes, definitely on a different level, I would say. <laughs> I would say. Uh, what are some of the other things that you've done at Game Playwright uh, besides uh, put out the white box? Sure. Well, the Things We Think About Games was the original book that we did, and that was inspired pretty much directly by a book called uh, 101 Things I Learned in Architecture School, which has since spawned a, a series of books of 101 Things I Learned in Wherever. So there's 101 Things About Film School and Law School and so on. They're great books, and their basic format is that each spread of the book has a one sentence or three paragraph or very short distillation of some crucial thing from that discipline. So we did a book about games, things we think about game design and about um, role playing and about creating games. So we did that book. That was our first one that Will and I co-wrote. The next thing that we did was called The Bones, which is a book that Will edited that is full of essays about dice, but that is not really about dice. They use dice as a gateway into all kinds of things that the different essayists Will Recruited wanted to talk about. So the essay that I wrote in that book is about the, uh, the solid metal dice that the GM of my high school Rollmaster campaign handmade on his older brother's metalworking machinery, like in his garage, and how that was an important touchstone for me. That entire campaign was, but this particular GM style. So it was really talking about that time in my life and those dice were a way into that. And most of the other essayists did kind of the same thing. They had something that they wanted to talk about that was real and important and uh, of gravity where, where dice were kind of the way in for that. And then the other book that we have published was called Hamlet's Hit Points. Robin <laughs> Laws wrote that, and it is a exploration of a of a way to analyze story. He had written a uh, series of live journal posts at the time about analyzing using this beat system that he had developed uh, the Shakespeare's play Hamlet. And once he finished up that analysis, I said, well, I think that that would, would make a good book. I think people would buy that and would value from understanding that system. And so we talked to him about that, and he added two more stories to that analysis. And so we published that as Hamlet's Hit Points. And that has been far and away the best-selling game playwright title to date. Um, and... I would have to go back and do all kinds of math with old sales records to find out whether there are more backers of the white box now than there are of people who have purchased Hamlet's hit points today. But both of those hmm. have um, been been great successes for game playwrights. So those are the four things that we have done so far. Okay. Okay. And it's not a competition. They can both be good. They, they can both be good. Absolutely. We love all our children equally. <laughs> that's, so things, that's... That we've got, things that we've got coming up include a kind of a, a sequel to Hamlet's Hit Points that Robin has written that is currently in the editorial process. And it will be called Beating the Story. And whereas Hamlet's Hit Points is more a tool for analysis, 
feeding the story is more a tool for development of uh, any kind of story. So if you uh, would like to be a novelist or you would like to be a screenwriter or you just like to think about those things, or if you are already one of those things, we hope that beating this story is kind of a tool that helps you understand building blocks of story so that you can do it better. So that one is coming. Um, and then the other one that we have started working on recently and that is now also fully drafted is a book that is based on the writing that Gary Ray has done on his blog. He runs a game store in the Bay Area called Black Diamond Games. Uh, that is far and away the best blog about the business of game retailing that exists to my knowledge. Uh, mm -hmm. And so he has written a book that distills a lot of the things that he has written on Quest for Fun, which is the name of his blog, into a longer form work that uh, that is a that is his advice for someone who would like to start a game store and earn a living at that and to earn an honest to God middle class living from the business of doing a game store. And I think that he um, he does that very credibly. I think that you could pick that book up and do it because it contains what you need. And, and to this point, I don't feel like anyone else has offered up that information before in a in as credible a way. That's uh, that's good. So you're staying very busy. <laughs> it is stupid. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's stupid busy. Um, we that should stuff is on top of all of the stuff that I'm doing at Atlas, which is a oh. full time job. In oh, that, that, that's right. Because you're, you're back for the third time, right? Yes. <laughs> third time that you've. OK, great. Um, and and we should mention that the white box did get successfully uh, funded on Kickstarter. Uh, very well funded on Kickstarter, I might add. And um, what what is the process now for like the what? I, I know that this is a long process for Kickstarter. I, I've heard it from so many people. What what do you do with the white box now? Sure. Well, the short answer is that we send it to press. We're very close, actually, to sending files out. Even today, I was putting in um, proofreading corrections even earlier this morning. So we launched with the hope that we would release this, release the physical editions of it in October in time for it to be a holiday gift. So in order to make that happen, you just walk yourself backwards through when does all the stuff need to go in. So the thing we need to do first is send the print files to the factory where it will be made at Cardamundi in Europe. And then once those files are off, they'll start their pre-press process and then their printing and their assembly process, and then they'll ship it back out to the various places where it'll be distributed. So once we've shipped off those print files, we will take those print files and use them to prepare all of the different digital editions. So we'll produce a PDF edition that will format uh, in order to be read on tablets as opposed to in spreads in a book. And we'll prepare an EPUB version, we'll prepare a Kindle version. And one of the stretch goals that we unlocked is that we'll also produce an audiobook version. So we'll be working on all of those different digital editions while the folks at Carta Mundi are doing all of their stuff. So the digital editions will come out in August, the physical editions will ship in October. Um, and that doesn't even begin to address all of the logistical issues, I guess, of receiving the printed things in the UK and in our St. Paul office. And we'll be distributing from Australia and from Canada as well. Yeah. So there's just a lot of, I mean, frankly, there's just a lot of email and of coordination and logistics <laughs> and stuff. Right, right. There's a lot of working parts to this process. Right. Um, uh, Jeff, I have to say that I, I think I've, I've been really just trying to hold Alex back from asking you a stupid <laughs> amount of 40K questions <laughs> because I know that that's what he would do. Um, I, I will, however, Alex, if you would like to. I, I actually wasn't going to ask specifically okay. about 40K. I sure. probably don't even have any good answers <laughs> to those. Questions. Also, to be fair, Nathan, I know you don't know much about that IP, but the Horus Heresy is 30K, not 40K. I am so sorry. <laughs> I, 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 um, I feel terrible. I, I did want to ask you, because uh, as we went over just briefly, we looked at like what you'd done, and I realized, wow, this guy's way out of our league. Um, and we looked at like all the all the different things that um, it 
you have worked on. And there's a lot of big name stuff in there, like the Dragon Age RPG, Beowulf, Lord of the Rings, stuff like that. And I was wondering for you, what's the most interesting um, IP that's not your own that you've worked on to you? One of the ones, I don't know if this is the most interesting or not. I I would need to have a list in front of me and then would risk offending somebody, I guess. <laughs> One of the, but, but Dragon Age you brought up, and I really enjoyed working on that. I was, uh, for about a year, the line developer on that Dragon Age line at Green Ronin. And one of the things that I really, really liked about early Dragon Age was the way that it turned uh, traditional ideas about fantasy races around. Uh, one of the things that I do not particularly care for in the Lord of the Rings is the idea that elves are better than everybody else. Uh, <laughs> I, I I find it really boring, especially the players who would like to play elf characters so that they can be better than everybody else, <laughs> which is just not interesting dramatically or from a game design standpoint. Mm -hmm. But in the Dragon Age world, um, the elves are... Uh, explicitly marginalized by human society. They are forced to live in ghettos in cities. And I thought that that was such an interesting take. And it sort of signaled to me that Dragon Age would be a world that they were creating that was not like all of the other fantasy worlds. I really, really liked the game design that Chris Premis did on the core engine for Dragon Age as well. Uh, so those were two things that I really enjoyed about that about that particular series of projects. I thought that was just great. Nice. And then the other side of that, I had actually um, noticed uh, you did writing for League of Legends? Uh, a, a very little bit of dialogue writing for League of Legends. Okay. It, extremely, extremely small. Because I had looked at that and I go, I'm like, is this the one I'm thinking of? And I looked and go, no, it's the one that millions of people play online and I refuse to play because reasons. Um, and I was like, I didn't know they had writing for it. So I was really confused. Sure. I mean, the, the dialogue that the characters speak has to be written by somebody. Of course. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. okay. Is there a specific character like you worked on, if I can even ask that? or uh, Well, you would certainly ask. I'm pretty sure that I am not allowed to say. Okay. <laughs> there you go, Alex. No yeah. worries. No, I just it threw me off because I'm like that is a really really huge game. Yeah, we we noticed that there were a lot of fairly big games that were in your repertoire. Um, I did want to ask though on that note uh, something that I'm kind of interesting in, uh, in is uh, the idea if you're working on an existing IP and you have worked on a few of those, is it different than if you're working on your own? Oh, absolutely it is, because you have to get permission from that licensor to do to do literally every part of the thing. So you yeah. create a version of it and you send it up the chain and they say yes or no to any given part of it, uh, which can be very frustrating at times and it can take a long time. Uh, but it sort of is what it is. The thing that you are buying is essentially exposure for that project. By, by bringing that license on. Right. I, I can imagine that that is, a, that is one more level to deal with uh, in the process. And um, some different licensors are easier to work with than others. Um, some of those collaborations have been very rewarding. Others have been particularly frustrating. I think that as a professional who has a career over time, you just learn to think of those as... Um, as necessary, as a necessary part of the job. It becomes part of your job to internally sell your ideas to a licensor and to understand what they, what their concerns are. And to the extent that you can proactively understand those concerns and do designs in the first place that don't violate them, you'll be much more successful. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, Jeff, I know your time is short. Uh, if I may ask you one question I have not asked uh, people in a very long time, but I want to bring it back. Oh, if it'd be all right. Now I'm wondering sure. which one you're bringing back. Uh, well, yeah, I know I had a couple, but <laughs> um, I, I, this is a sort of an easy question, but not really an easy question um, that I was asking of a lot of people. We did an episode on it. Um, what makes a game memorable? I think 
the, the key thing that makes a game memorable is a particular experience of playing it. And that involves all of the stuff that surrounds that experience of playing it. It could include the other people that you're playing it with, or it could be specific elements of that game in terms of its mechanics or whatever. Um, I tend to go to the idea that specific narrative that grows out of that experience is a key thing. And by the narrative, I don't really mean the theme of the game or even the elements of the story that happen inside the game. But um, I think that people experience things in terms of stories, right? Stories have beginnings and middles and ends, and they have transition points. And I think that you can experience gameplay that way. I wrote, in fact, an essay that I wrote about this is included in the white box. It originally appeared in the Kobold Guide to Game Design, but it's about this idea that your experience of playing a game is itself a story. And I think that if that story of your play is interesting, that is the way that you experience the narrative of sitting there and playing the game, whether that's because of the game or whether it's because of your mental or psychological state where you, where you played the game or whether it's because it is a great convention that you really wanted to go to or because you won a tournament or because of the other players that you were playing with. I think they become memorable because the story of your gameplay was incredibly interesting to you. Excellent. That is uh, that is a much better answer than I usually get. <laughs> well, that's so, great news. Thank you. So, so there you go. Yeah, Alex, was there was there another question? I you can probably squeeze one in <laughs> if you have a question. I'm I'm really excited and I've I've really enjoyed talking to both him and uh, Jeremy. And it's like I'm super excited to get the white box when it ships. Now it's going to be right in time for my birthday. Awesome. So there I'm you gonna, go. I'm gonna be like, yay! I'm gonna put it on the desk I've got, and I'm just gonna be like, let's make something. <laughs> yeah, I hope you do. That's that's awesome. Like I know we we mentioned, like I have that big hurdle of uh, where do I go to? So hopefully, we'll uh, when I get this, I'll be able to read stuff and work on stuff and kind of overcome some of my own personal things with design and just be like, hey, I've got a prototype. Somebody play it. So there I you go. so I'm excited. And I'm I'm really glad you and Jeremy got together to do this, so people like me can have it and be able to learn from it. Awesome, absolutely. Uh, and uh, Jeff, I know we could we we probably have a million other questions, but I know that you need to get going soon. Um, and I should, uh, I should run. I got to get this uh, book to press for one thing. See? Oh well, there you go. see, we should probably let you get to we that. We should let him do that so I can get that book, so that you can go and get that book. Okay, <laughs> so we we won't keep you any longer. Uh, but Jeff, thank you absolutely so much for coming on and talking to us. Thank you. I appreciate you hosting. Oh well, I, I hope we did an okay job. Uh, and if you ever have something that you want to come and talk about, you know where to find us. Awesome. I will do. Awesome. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. All right. Bye-bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Alex, I feel like there should be a white box for podcasting. Yes, we can call it the pod box. Oh, yeah. That that sounds pretty good. Or the white pod. Who knows? Whatever works. Uh, if you would be interested in finding out more information about the white box, uh, you can actually just go to the Kickstarter page, uh, check it out, see uh, all the cool things that are involved in it. The link in the description. The link is in the description. Makes it a little easier for you to find it. Uh, if you want more information about uh, Jeff Tidball, you can go to jefftidball.com. That is J E F F. T-I-D-B-A-L-L dot com. And you can see why we were so very surprised by his long resume. Um, and, uh, and if you want to find out more about uh, Jeremy Holcomb, I, I don't know, I guess go to uh, his classes at DigiPen Institute of Technology. Alex is already signed up, right? Yeah, I'm working on that right now with all the money I have for classes and also it's on the other coast yeah so that that's kind of tricky too but uh you know we we have dreams uh you can also find more information about the show our show at delvecast.com and alex what can they find there you can find the podcast and some awesome articles written by some awesome game designers and developers and me and, and, you can, and me uh and uh and some other upcoming things that we're working on 
right now, and hopefully you will be able to see in the near future. Uh, you can also find us on iTunes and on Google Play, and there are links at the below of the show description uh, for you to check that out. You can also find us on uh, that thing called Twitter. I think it's called Twitter, right? Yeah. Or Twitter? It's Twitter. Yeah, on Twitter. Uh, I am at Titanium. I'm at EXP Limited. The show is at Delve Podcast. And you can also find Jeff at Jeff Tidball, just like the website, except with an at symbol. In uh, front of it. Twitter. And, yes. and, and, no, and no, dot com. no dot com. Yeah, no dot com. Yeah, in, in case anyone was thinking at Jeff Tidball dot com was a thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, don't think it, I don't think they actually accept dots on uh, Twitter. I'm not sure. Have to check that out. Uh, but we are uh, so very uh, surprised and happy that Jeremy and Jeff came on the show simultaneously to tag team on this episode. Uh, So much information in such a short period of time. uh, And, uh, and they had a lot of other things that I know that they have to do, uh, but they made time for us and we are really, really happy that they did. Right, Alex? Yes. Very thankful that they took the time out of their busy, busy, busy days Mm. uh, to come on and talk to us. Um, And hopefully when I get the white box, I'll be able to share that with everybody. Yes, and then you can also see how cool it is and uh, and how it's going to be useful for fledgling game designers just like Alex here. Yes. Uh, And so for all of us at Delve, uh, again, thank you for joining us. Uh, We really hope that you enjoyed this episode as much as we did. And uh, until next time, thank you for joining us. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.